A year ago, AMD launched its 5800X3D processor that was the first of its kind, as it had an increased L3 cache, and thanks to its excellent gaming performance, it was a resounding success. It is now the best-selling processor by month in Europe. Therefore, it is not surprising that in the Ryzen 7000 lineup, AMD decided to play big. They made 8, 12 and even 16 core X3D processors. They got a total of 150 megabytes of cache. You can easily store Windows 95 in such a cache. But this time, a miracle didn't happen. There are issues with both performance and reliability. And there are pitfalls that AMD decided not to talk about. So let's figure out what kind of cache it is, whether it is worth considering buying Ryzen 7000 X3D processors, what you need to know, and why you should only buy them from an official retailer. This is MK. Today we're talking about the somewhat sad truth about the huge Team Red cache. And to begin with, what is a cache? This is a small amount of very fast memory which is located as close as possible to the compute units of the processor and is needed to make your processor real fast. The thing is that from the processor's standpoint, RAM is located too far away and this became a bottleneck for desktop CPUs back in the 90s when they reached frequencies over 100 MHz. This led to the fact that the clock cycle time decreased to a handful of nanoseconds while accessing RAM takes an order more or even two orders more. Luckily, Intel found a way out. They gave the processor a small amount of its very own memory, access to which takes one clock cycle, or in the worst case, several clock cycles. Storing instructions and important data in such a cache makes it possible to significantly reduce the compute unit's idle time while they're waiting for data, which resulted in a performance gain. But then why until recently no one cared much about the cache? I mean, people do know that in modern CPUs there are three levels of cache differing in speed and capacity that in total reach several dozens of megabytes. And that's it. The answer to this question is simple. The last time when the cache problem was prominent was in the early 2000s, when a baseline Celeron didn't have enough L2 cache. It only had 128 kilobytes compared to 256 or even 512 kilobytes for the Pentium 4 on the LG478. The effect it had was that at the same frequencies, the Celeron could be 20-30% to 30 slower than the Pentium. The thing is that at that time, the cache was expensive and had problems, much like almost any new technology. And at the same time, it occupied a huge portion of the die area, just the way it does now. Therefore, to reduce the production cost, they would cut down the cache volume. By the mid-2000s, with the release of the LGA-775, the problems had been solved, and even the baseline Core 2 Duo was generously flavored with as much as 4 megabytes of cache, while the later Core 2 Quad could boast of 12 megabytes of fast L2 memory. And since then, the cache technology didn't change much. There was an even lower L3 level cache that appeared, which even integrated graphics could have access to, but in general, the formula of 2 to 3 megabytes of cache per core didn't change since then, because processors literally did not need more data for quick access. This is why the fifth generation of Intel processors, aka Broadwell, released in 2014, failed miserably. An attempt to add 64 or 128 megabytes of ED RAM memory or a fourth level cache on a separate chip gave a real performance boost only in few tasks that involved processing a huge amount of predictable data, such as archiving. In games, when working with multimedia or graphics, the new chips often turned out to be even worse than their predecessors due to lower clock speeds. But of course, ED RAM was not a complete dead end. It was the fifth generation where Intel significantly boosted its Iris integrated graphics, which also had access to this memory. This gave rise to several lineups of Ultrabooks that were able to run new games on integrated graphics, including The Witcher 3 at ultra low settings. But of course, in the case of desktops, it was of little interest to anyone. So, with the release of Skylake, Intel preferred to leave the L4 cache behind. And now, almost 10 years after the release of the 5th gen, AMD suddenly announced an 8 core Ryzen 5800X 3D with an additional 64 MB L3 cache layer. It was not easy to produce. An additional cache is located on top of the die with cores, and in order for this sandwich to fit under the processor lid, 95% of empty silicon had to be sliced off, bringing the thickness of the core die to only 0.02 millimeters. 
Another thing that helped was the use of the latest B2 stepping, which allowed to reduce operating voltages, as well as clock speeds that were lowered by a couple of hundred megahertz compared to the regular 5800X. And the cherry on the cake, such a processor will not be able to overclock using traditional methods through the BIOS. AMD explains this by the fact that the 3DV cache die is rather delicate, and it may not survive an increased voltage. But the most interesting question was what kind of performance gain would a tripled L3 cache volume give? After all, over the past decade, we've become used to the fact that the cache volume is not something we would care about, and no one has been studying its impact on performance for a long time, and it wasn't really possible either since both AMD and Intel usually decrease the cache volume along with the core count, and the latter obviously has a stronger effect. On the other hand, Ryzen's have always had problems with RAM access latency due to the chiplet structure, so it is these CPUs that should benefit the most out of increased cache volume. On top of that, AMD's solutions with one die turned out to be twice as slow in writing data to memory as the more expensive 12 and 16 core Ryzen's with two dies. An increased cache volume was supposed to solve this problem too. And in fact, it did. Of course, the slogan that AMD promoted that the Ryzen 5800X3D is the best gaming processor was a bit of an overstatement. After all, the best Intel CPU at that time, the i9-12900KS, was slightly faster in games, albeit significantly more expensive and hotter. But the performance boost compared to the regular 5800X, even taking into account the slightly higher clock speeds of the latter, was quite noticeable. On average, about 20%. Even the 16-core 5950X was worse in gaming performance. Although there is nothing surprising here. There are not so many games out in the wild that could utilize so many cores. But in productivity tasks, the X3D's performance turned out to be much more modest. In most programs, the 5800X turned out to be even faster. The 5800X3D was slightly faster only in memory-intensive archiving tasks. And this is understandable. Most such tasks are predictable, which makes it possible to do with a smaller cache volume, especially considering that 32 megabytes for the 8-core 5800X is more than in the 16-core i9-12900K, which only has 30. But video games are not quite as predictable, and often require more memory, so a large cache volume really manages to cover for the RAM access latency. As a result, everyone was okay with this situation on the AM4 platform. If you want the unlimited gaming performance on a 5-year-old socket on par with the 12th generation Intel processors, the 5800X3D is the way to go, even if your motherboard is not really top of the line and its VRM kinda sucks, since this processor is quite power efficient due to the selected chip and reduced clock speeds. If you want the ultimate performance in productivity tasks, go for the 16-core 5950X, which is quite on par with the i9-12900K. Let's give credit where credit is due. AMD ended the AM4 era in the best way they could. So now it remains to answer only two questions. Why did Intel not go back to the ED RAM technology? And how are the new AM5 3DV cache Ryzen's doing? Speaking of Intel, the answer is simple. They do not need an increased cache. They keep using single monolithic die with all cores and controllers inside, unlike the chiplet Ryzen. As a result, Team Blue has RAM access in intercore latency significantly lower than Team Red, so Intel processors feel quite comfortable with a relatively small cache volume, which Intel increases a bit from time to time anyway. At the same time, in the next 14th generation, Intel, according to rumors, will transition to the chiplet structure too and will go back to the idea of the L4 cache, which will be dedicated to the integrated graphics. Given that the latter will be based on the ARC architecture, Intel may have a chance to compete for the title of the best integrated graphics manufacturer with AMD, who is still in the lead in this field. As for AMD, the company continued to use the chiplet structure. As a result, the Ryzen 7000s have one or two dies with cores and one I.O. die that also has simple integrated graphics on it. That is, the RAM controller is again separated from the cores, but AMD did their best to reduce the latency. In the Ryzen 7000, the frequency of the Infinity Fabric bus has been increased to 2000 MHz, which was previously available only for the best Ryzen 5000 CPUs, and only if overclocked. In addition, in the case of DDR5, it is the large internal delays that have a big impact. Therefore, even in the case of single-chip Intel processors, the transition from DDR4 increases the memory access latency up to one and a half times. As a result, in the case of the Ryzen 7000 lineup, RAM latency is comparable to that of Intel Core 12 and 13 Gen, 
when working with DDR5 at the same frequency, and there is no big difference between them in terms of bandwidth. But at the same time, the 13th gen Intel has better overclocking capabilities. You can try to squeeze up to 7000 MHz, breaking through 100 GB per second of bandwidth. So does it mean that the increased cache of the Ryzen CPUs is a must? Well, it's both yes and no. Let's start with the top-end Ryzen 7900X3D and 7950X3D. They initially have two processor chiplets with 32 MB of L3 memory each. And now, a 64 MB 3D vCache layer is added on top one of them, bringing the total volume of the third level cache to 128 MB. And this leads to a new curious issue. It turns out that one processor die is now thinner and with 96 MB of memory, and the second is a regular one with 32. And of course, it takes a long time to get the data from the cache of the first die in order to process it in the second die. Another issue comes from the days of the Ryzen 5800X 3D. The fact that the die has two layers and is therefore very thin and delicate makes it so that the clock speed and the TDP are limited, and the latter is decreased quite noticeably, from 170 to 120 watts. It is quite obvious that in productivity tasks, which for the most part do not need a huge L3 cache, the regular Ryzen CPUs without the 3D cache are both slightly faster and significantly cheaper. On top of that, the additional cache volume did not fix the problem with the low DDR5 latency, simply because for productivity tasks it's not even a problem in the first place. For render tasks, even the transition from single to dual channel doesn't make any difference, let alone quad channel. And what about games? Additional L3 cache significantly boosted the 5800X, therefore it is not surprising that the Ryzen 7000 lineup has a similar effect. Both Windows and the game devs have already learned how to work with AMD's chiplets and they tried to put all the load on the first chiplet, that is, the one that has the 3D vCache on it. So both 7950X3D and 7900X3D are 10-15% to faster than their regular versions, which is not surprising, and even the 13900K is slightly behind. But here's an interesting nuance. As we have already explained in one of our previous videos, 8 cores for gaming will be enough for a very long time. That is, getting a 16-core 7950X3D solely for gaming is not the most sensible idea, while for productivity tasks, the regular versions of the CPU is better. So it turns out that the top-end X3Ds make sense only for those who do both productivity tasks and gaming. And when I say gaming, I mean real elite gaming with a graphics card of the 4090 level. As you can imagine, there are only a handful of people like that, so for the majority of people, these are not the solutions to go for. So let's go down to the more popular 8-core Ryzen 7800X 3D. In productivity tasks, the situation is exactly the same as with the more expensive Ryzen's. The regular 7700X is a little faster due to higher clock speeds. But on the other hand, no one buys such processors to calculate weather conditions on Mars. But for games, 8-core is optimal. And here the 3D vCache is obviously a bonus. The extra 64 MB of cache makes it 10-15% to faster, and as a result, the 7800X 3D directly competes with the top-end much more expensive i9-13900K. It would seem that there it is, the best gaming processor of our time. But again, there's a nuance. The 5800X 3D is good, among other things, because it's the cherry on the cake of the AM4 platform. There is nothing better for gaming on this socket, and there will never be. And if you want even more FPS that it could possibly provide, you need to overspend a lot on the AM5 or LGA1700. But in the case of AM5, the Ryzen 7000 lineup is the first, but far from the last. And taking into account the fact that even a regular Ryzen 7 7700X is quite enough for the RTX 1490 in 2K resolution and higher, there is no point whatsoever in getting a 7800X 3D, because in about a year the Ryzen 8000 lineup will be released, which is rumored to be 20-25% to faster and which will definitely be faster than the current X3Ds, while at the same time quite likely less expensive. So the 7800X 3D is certainly good, but only here and now and only for those who want to play games on a top-end GPU in Full HD on a 360Hz panel, maxing out the FPS. For the more realistic gaming scenarios, it makes no sense to pay an extra $150 for some extra 64 megabytes of cache. You will only be able to see that difference at frame rates far beyond 200, which is the difference that is hardly noticeable at that point 
not to mention that it's quite a rare occasion. Then maybe you can benefit from the 3DV cache in some other cases. The first thing that comes to mind is the integrated graphics which appeared in the new top-end Ryzen 7000. There were rumors that the extra 64 megabytes of cache will increase its performance by as much as 3 to 4 times. Alas, as it turns out, the real boost is less than 10%. That is not to mention that this integrated graphics is only good enough to run Dota at low settings. But perhaps the worst thing about all this is that the new Ryzen 7000 X3Ds turned out to be way too delicate, and although overclocking of any X3D processors via the BIOS is locked, there are some utilities that allow you to increase the voltage on the processor, with a sad result. Going just slightly beyond 1.35 volts leads to a guaranteed death of the CPU. This also applies to the Ryzen 5800X3D, by the way. On top of that, even if you don't mess around with overclocking, there have been numerous reports of the top-end Ryzen 7900X3D and 7950X3D dying on their own. Some die the next day they were purchased, others in a month or so. Perhaps the reason is the uneven heating of the two processor dies, because only one of them has a second layer with the cache. But in any case, this is a fairly massive problem. And if you live in a place like I do, where you can't really get such a CPU from an official retailer, with a warranty and such, if a couple of weeks after the purchase your new Ryzen departs for the Silicon Valhalla, chances are you won't be able to get a refund. And this is quite a huge amount of money. Whether this problem concerns the single die Ryzen 7800X3D is still unknown. But it would make sense not to rush for it and wait a bit to see if it's affected too. It usually so happens that new technologies are not so good at the start, and then as time goes on they get better. But with the 3DV cache, everything turned out to be exactly the opposite. The Ryzen 7 5800X 3D turned out to be an extremely good processor that prolonged the life of the AM4 socket for many years to come. AMD had every chance to repeat this success with the AM5, but failed. The top end 16 core processors, which are normally purchased for productivity tasks, do not get a boost from the extra L3 cache volume at all, and sometimes are even slower than their regular versions. The 8-core 7800X3D, on the other hand, turned out to be the best gaming CPU of our time indeed, only it's hard to actually feel it, whereas it's quite easy to feel the price difference. And given the fact that the advanced Ryzen 8000s are already on their way and coming rather soon, plus the reports about the 7100X3D's malfunctions, there is no point in buying such processors. And if we keep in mind that the regular Ryzen 7000 without the 3D cache are already getting cheaper, if I were you, I would rather look that way. They are still the best price to performance choice on the AM5 platform. This was MK, my name is Mikhail Krashen. I'll see you again.